people a chance if they're running late. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, we have in the last few seminars, we've started running these polls every week to get to know our audience a bit better to build some community. And uh, so if you look at the bottom of the window, you'll see uh, the polls tab. And this week, we're asking, um, in your view, which is the most overlooked physiological system with which the nervous system interacts in terms of research? So um, I'll be very interested to see uh, what people think about this one. Um, yeah. So um, we're also live on YouTube. Uh, that's running. So um, welcome back to those of you who've joined us before. Uh, for those of you who haven't, um, uh, welcome to. Uh, this is um, a seminar series called the Brain Body Interaction Seminar Series, uh, which we've been running for a few months now. Um, it's a uh, weekly seminars every week on Mondays. And they cover many different aspects of how the nervous system interacts with the body. Um, so from cancer biology to um, the gut, to taste, to um, how the brain controls movement and uh, detects the movement of the body. So uh, the idea here is really to bring people together from different aspects of neuroscience and different parts of biology um, who are interested in interactions with the nervous system. Um, and uh, we hope that uh, you get something out of that and that you'll be able to join us for future seminars. Um, as you may have seen when you signed up for this, we're, we'll have an extended uh, Q&A, particularly aimed at uh, students uh, and postdocs after the seminar. Um, if you... Uh, if you didn't sign up, but you're interested in joining that, then uh, just drop me a message here on Crowdcast or send an email um, and I can share the Zoom link for, um, with you. Uh, during the seminar, if you want to ask a question, uh, you can, the best way is if you go to the ask a question tab here at the bottom um, and you'll be able to type in your question and if, you'll see questions that other people have asked. And if you'd like to uh, uh, put your weight behind someone else's question, you can vote for that question to be asked and so on. If you want to ask a question and you would like to ask it yourself, I can bring you on screen. If you want to do that, just put on screen at the end of your question and I'll hand it over to you to ask it instead of reading it out myself at the end. Um, yeah. And um, anything else, just write in the chat. Yeah. OK, so let's get started. Um, uh, so as I mentioned, this is a seminar series in which we cover many different aspects of brain-body interactions. So, so far, we've had seminars covering how the nervous system interacts with the immune system, uh, glia, the gut, um, the lungs the sense of taste, um, food intake and obesity. Uh, but this time we'll be looking at different aspects of brain-body interactions, which is how the nervous system senses movement of the body and how it controls uh, complex movements. So uh, with that, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Brad Dickerson, our speaker for this week. Um, so Brad is a, a long time uh, entomologist He's studied several different insect species through his career so far, um, and he's long been interested in how insects uh, fly. So um, Brad got his PhD from the University of Washington in Seattle, where he studied the role of mechanosensory feedback in flight control. Um, and then he moved to the lab of Michael Dickinson in Caltech. Um, and there he studied the function of Haltiers, which are these structures which are uh, evolved from um, wings in uh, dipterans and um, and their role in flight, how they influence spike timing uh, in wing motor neurons, and how that capability evolved from 
four four winged fly ancestors. So Brad uh, moved last year to start his lab um, at UNC um, in Chapel Hill, and uh, there he's a keen and honors fellow. And the lab continues to study the function of whole tears as well as the neural circuitry which controls Drosophila flight. And he'll be telling us much more about that um, today. Um, so uh, Dr. Dickinson, I'd like to thank you for joining us today. Particularly, I didn't, I didn't realize this when I invited you, but of course today is a national holiday in the US. So I appreciate you making the time. It's, uh, for those of you who don't know, today is Indigenous Peoples Day. And so it's a good opportunity for those of us, particularly in the Americas, to recognize um, the land on which we uh, live and the history um, of how it was taken from the indigenous people. Um, so with that, I'd like to um, hand it over to Brad to, um, to take it away with the seminar. Great. Thank you, Sam, and uh, thank you for inviting me. I, we were talking before we started about how um, the, the people that are that are included in this group are um, they study a range of topics, and I and as I was looking at some of the topics, I felt like sort of the odd person out. But um, hopefully, hopefully, we'll, we can have some fun regardless. All right, so. Um, Today I want to tell you about uh, a combination of some older work and some work that's in progress uh, regarding uh, a conserved hind wing circuit in Drosophila flight control. Um, and so before we do that, I just want to plug, so this is my, my building. Um, I can't really point to you where, to where my office is, but um, my lab just started, so feel free to check out my website. You know, I'm always happy to talk about opportunities or if you just want to chat about um, the work the lab has going on. Okay, so animals across a range of taxa uh, rely on precise spike timing to control uh, a range of complex behaviors, whether it's uh, hunting for prey, like in the case of barn owls, or echolocating bats, or for um, navigating the environment, or uh, detecting conspecifics, as in the case of weakly electric fish, uh, each of these animals have evolved specialized neural circuits to detect timing differences at the uh, micro or nanosecond uh, time scale. Uh, and increasingly, what we're beginning to appreciate is the role of timing precision in motor systems, whether it's human motor control, like in the, the case of this doubles tennis match, um, motor control of um, singing in zebra finches, or um, or also in insect flight. And this is an animal that I used to work on as a graduate student, hawk moth, uh, Manduca sexta. Uh, and so I wanna zoom in on insect flight and focus on um, a particular animal and particular kinds of behavior. And the animal or group of animals I wanna focus on are flies uh, or dipterans. So they have uh, just two wings. And so this is a high speed video of a Hoverfly out in um, Pacific Northwest, and you can see it sort of darts across the screen, stops on a dime, and then you can also see it rotates its body relative to its head, and then it accelerates across the screen. So this animal is able to do this kind of behavior um, at a really rapid time scale, collecting visual and mechanosensory input um, on a at sub millisecond time scales, and, it, and is able to execute these maneuvers um, at, in turn at the same time scale. So um, even though you know when I when I go out into when I go out of this building and I see a hoverfly, I'll, I'll stop and just like watch it for you know minutes on end until it flies away. Um, it's not really tractable for the, for some of the questions I'm interested in to study hoverflies. So my study organism is um, the noble fruit fly Drosophila melanogaster, and so um, there are a couple of reasons to study uh, the problems of timing in in uh, nervous systems and in motor systems in Drosophila. Uh, so one of those is that um, there's the powerful genetic toolkit in fruit flies for labeling and manipulating um, different cell types or genetic circuits. And so for example, um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about these. these this is a confocal stack of the, um, of the wing steering muscles, so the muscles that control 
uh, wing motion um, labeled with GFP. And this is taken by Ancestor, who I who I see is in the, the sort of online crowd. Um, uh, and so on the one hand, we have the uh, genetic tools for labeling manipulating cell types in Drosophila. And the other benefit of studying this problem in fruit flies is that they fly very well in a lab setting. And so we can take advantage of that and um, present them with all sorts of different sensory uh, situations and look at how they take that sensory input and transform it into motor output. So for example, this is a, a sort of standard tool in um, now in my lab and also the lab the labs I came from as a graduate student and postdoc where you can tether a flying insect uh, to a pin, in this case it's a fly tethered to a pin, and then you can have it um, in between an infrared LED and a photodetector pair, and so as the wings are beating, they cast a shadow on the photodetector, and the difference in the left and right um, wing beat controls the uh, controls the angular velocity of a stripe in front of the fly. And so this, in this case, when the fly has control over its sensory experience, we say it's operating in closed loop. Um, alternatively, um, you can have, you can just have some arbitrary pattern playing in this LED arena and um, the fly has no control over its sensory experience. And so then the fly is said to be experiencing an open loop stimulus. And so let me just give you a sense of what this looks like. So this is, a fly that's tethered to a, a pin, and so you can see the the wing stroke envelope on, on both wings. And you can see it's it's subtly changing back and forth, and um, in this case, the the stripe is being controlled by the left minus right wing beat amplitude. So what we can do is uh, marry the genetic tools that that have been developed and are continuing continuing to be developed in Drosophila um, with the tools that we have for looking at um, how the how the, the sensory system transforms um, transforms input from the world into uh, motor output. Okay. So if we take a closer look at a fly um, as they're executing, you know, these kinds of behaviors. So in this case, it's taking it's this is shot at seven thousand five hundred frames a second. So this this sort of turn is taking place in less than a human eye blink. Um, these kinds of maneuvers are controlled by a set of um, steering muscles that insert directly on the wing hinge um, onto these tendon-like elements called sclerites. And so there are um, four sclerites of interest and each of them um, control a set, each of them are controlled by a set of muscles. So we have the basilar sclerite and its associated muscles, the uh, first axillary, the third axillary, and the fourth axillary, which for historical reasons is known as the HG. So one thing I just want to point out here is just that you know there are only twelve muscles here, so this is what we what we would call a sparse network. Um, and moreover, the the um, steering muscles are each innervated by a single motor neuron. Okay, so uh, there's a, a reduced set of of control elements. And so a question that that motivates my research is how is it that with such a limited set of control elements, flies can execute um, all this kind of fine scale motor control we see out in the world. Okay. So um, the, the muscles associated with each sclerite can be, a, can be broken down into two basic groups. So, um, so flies are beating their wings, particularly fruit flies are beating their wings um, in excess of 200 times a second. So they're, they're operating near the upper limits of what um, a motor neuron and muscle can do. Um, and so one set of muscles are said to be tonically active, meaning that they, they fire once per, per stroke, every stroke at a pr precise time or phase in the stroke cycle. And so the only um, method that flies have of controlling these, these muscles while they're in flight is by introducing either a phase delay or a phase advance. So ch by changing the timing um, of when those muscles are active. And so what is the relevance of, of timing to a muscle? That's something I just wanna explore really quickly. Um, and just, just to be clear, the tonic muscles are thought to be mostly involved in um, controlling stabilization reflexes that are uh, visually mediated. So if we consider a muscle that is um, 
involved in locomotion. So it's uh, and locomotion, uh, a form of locomotion that is um, that involves like cyclic uh, changes in muscle length, like walking or swimming or flying. And we um, measure the length of a given muscle, and we also measure its force output. And we're able to measure when that muscle is activated in um, in this lengthening this lengthening and shortening cycle. What we can do is compute something called uh, the work loop, and from there we can interpret how the muscle functions um, in vivo. And and I mean, also you can use this to uh, you can use this experimentally to determine how a muscle could function in vivo. So for example. Um, if we imagine that you lengthen the muscle and you measure the force, you, you'll have some, some force output and then the area under that curve, you know, the, the force times change in distance is work. And then as the muscle shortens, you'll, you'll also get work output during shortening. And then the net uh, or the difference between these two would be the network per cycle. So depending on when a uh, muscle is activated, that will determine its um, its work output per cycle. So, for example, if a muscle is activated during the shortening phase, then the uh, work loop runs counterclockwise, and so the muscle is said to uh, generate positive work, which is intuitive to how we think about how muscles do work on the environment. Whereas, um, if the muscle is instead uh, activated near um, the beginning of short, during shortening, um, or during lengthening, I should say, excuse me, then the work loop runs uh, clockwise. And so it's said to be, said, said to, to absorb work. So it instead acts more like a spring. And there are all sorts of different variations um, of these. And so putting this in the context of our wing steering muscles in flies, uh, and looking at this muscle, the B1 muscle, it fires every single wing stroke at a precise phase in the stroke cycle. Um, what you find is that if you look at, so stress and strain are essentially just force versus length, just normalized. Um, if you look at a work loop for B1, um, you'll find that it actually runs clockwise. So this muscle absorbs work during flight. And then as you change the activation phase, it still absorbs work, but what ends up happening is that the muscle effectively becomes uh, stiffer. So I say all this to say that um, when a muscle is is active in when a muscle involved in locomotion is is activated, it determines its biomechanical properties. So we have these tonic muscles that, um, depending on when they're they're activated in the stroke cycle, um, can be stiffer or less stiff and seem to be involved in stabilization reflexes. And then the other uh, flavor of muscles are muscles that are said to be physically active. And these are a little bit more intuitive where they're either inactive or they come on in bursts. And um, these bursts, I should say, they are still uh, phase locked to the stroke cycle. So you'll still, so you'll still just get one um, spike per wing stroke, but you just get them firing just in a few wing strokes as opposed to the tonic muscles, which are firing um, basically every wing stroke. Okay. And uh, the phasic muscles are thought to be more involved in active maneuvers, so actively generated turns. And so, um, in addition, so in addition to the the wing steering muscles having um, a set of muscles associated with each uh, sclerite, they can be further subdivided, where um, the the muscles associated with each sclerite are either there's at least one tonic muscle and at least one phasic muscle. So I'll just go through that again, just to make okay. But in both cases, in the case of the tonic muscles and the phasic muscles, um, when they when they turn on is they come on as preferred phase in the wing stroke cycle. And so, how is it that that phase is determined? Oh, um, one other thing I should say is that. Um, and this is something that um, one of my former colleagues spent a lot of time worrying about is that the muscles that are tonically active are recruited um, in a linear fashion, where if you look at uh, the steering muscle activity 
as a function of the magnitude of return, whether flies turning more to the left or more to the right, they're recruited in a linear fashion, whereas the phasic muscles are recruited in a nonlinear fashion. But nonetheless, um, in both cases, they're when they're when they are active, they have a preferred phase in the stroke cycle. So how is that determined? Okay. So if we imagine a fly that's flapping its wings and you we just look at you know one motor neuron and it's firing once per wing stroke a preferred phase in the stroke cycle uh, you could the easiest thing to imagine the sort of null hypothesis is that you have um, descending input from the brain uh, controlling when this motor neuron fires so that you know when the fly is flying through the world it's getting visual input and now um, you can shift activation phase as needed right but um, of the of the descending inner neurons that have been identified and recorded from so far, there's no evidence that these um, neurons fire in a phase lock fashion. Instead, they they fire um, or they they send signals via uh, slow graded uh, changes in membrane potential. So for a long time, the hypothesis has been that flies uh, need to combine wing beat synchronous mechanosensory feedback in order to, with this visual input, to shift um, the firing phase or, or control um, the activation of the wing steering muscles. And so one obvious source of wing beat synchronous mechanosensory feedback are the wings themselves, and the wings have mechanosensors embedded in them, and I'll talk a bit more about that um, in a bit. But one problematic aspect of the hypothesis that the wings are helping control um, the, the phase of the wing steering muscles, even though they help set it, is that the, the output and the feedback from the wing is a direct result of the, um, of the wing steering muscles themselves. So you can use the, you can use wing beat synchronous feedback from the wings to, um, to set phase, but using using that feedback to adjust phase for um, controlling a maneuver is problematic because it, you know it's sort of circular that they're all they're only going to report what the wings were um, were essentially told to do. Now, um, one other potential source of wing beat synchronous feedback is uh, where I come in, with, and so flies being dipterans have two wings, and where they would have their hind wings, they have this little club-shaped structure called the halter. Okay, um, and so the halter is halters are specific, essentially, to two insect orders. So first, uh, diptera. So you know you can find this in any any true fly. So if we're talking about mosquitoes, uh, horse flies, or fruit flies, you'll find. Um, halter and they come in all sorts of different shapes and sizes, but you know, by and large, you have a a, a bulb, a stalk, and a base. Uh, and in addition to dipterans, also these um, strepsiptera, these twisted wing parasites, have halter-like structures. But instead of the hind wings being um, so the hind wings being the sort of halter-like structure, it seems as though that the, the four wings are instead, um, have been transformed into this club-like uh, structure. Okay. So one role for the halter is to, uh, is to beat up and down and provide wing beat synchronous feedback uh, to help structure um, the, the firing of the wing steering muscles just during, during normal flight. Uh, and in addition, something that the halter is well known for being is a, a sort of gyroscopic sensor. So if you imagine that a fly is flying, it's flapping its wings, um, the halteers actually beat, uh, in, in many flies, not all flies, they beat antiphase to the wing. So when the wing is up, the halter is coming down and, and vice versa. Um, and so this dotted line represents the, the sort of tip path of, of the end knob of the halter. So it's just beating up and down, right? And so if the fly gets uh, rotated by say a gust of wind or if you know one of its wings is shorter than the other and it, it gets rotated in some way, the halter, or both halters, uh, have a tendency to continue oscillating in their original plane of motion. So they experience an inertial force, um, which is called the Coriolis force. 
And what ends up happening is the, the trajectory, the tip path of the halt here actually changes. And um, this is known as the Coriolis force, which is um, proportional to the angular velocity of the body and the, the cross product of that with the tip velocity uh, of the halt here. So what this means is that um, the halt here is able to, to alert the fly to um, both what direction it's rotating and how fast it's rotating and um, helps mediate uh, corrective reflexes of the wings and the head. So that going back to that video I showed you at the beginning of the fly, um, sort of darting across the screen, one of the roles for the halt here is, help to, is to help stabilize gaze by helping stabilize the head because um, flying insects cannot move their eyes relative to their head. Okay, so that's, so that, so that's one of the major things the halt here does and is, is very famous for, for doing is, is being basically the only example of a, of a true biological gyroscope. There are certainly cases of inertial sensing in other animals like our vestibular system, but halt here is be actively beating up and down and acts uh, as, a, as a gyroscopic sensor. So if we take a, a closer look at the halt here, this is a um, confocal micrograph of, of a Drosophila halt here, and it's been labeled with uh, GFP. What we find is um, these rows and rows of these dome-shaped structures that are known as campaniform sensilla. So if we just take a look at one of these and take a slice through it, um, what you've got is uh, the exoskeleton and this sort of cap, and beneath it, uh, some connective tissue connected to the dendrite. And so just to, to make this a little bit more schematic, what we've got is uh, the exoskeleton embedded in some spongy tissue with the dendrite, cell body, and axon. And so whenever the exoskeleton gets bent or twisted, the, um, this cap is going to rise and fall. It's going to pull on the dendrite, open up um, uh, mechan mechanosensitive ion channels, and then you'll get the firing of an action potential. And um, you can find these kinds of sensors on anywhere where there's bending or twisting on an insect. So on the legs, on the wings, on the halt here, and uh, also you can find them on, in some cases, on the antennae. Um, so, what, so like I said, the you can find these sensors on the on the wing. So the halt here and the wing are serially homologous structures, and that is uh, indicative of the idea that the halt here has evolved from uh, the wing. And another observation that underscores the halt here's um, evolutionary history as a hind wing is that just as the wings have uh, have their own have their set of muscles that control their motion. Um, so does the halt here. So the halt here has uh, a power muscle that's responsible for helping drive it up and down, as well as a set of uh, steering muscles um, that we know from previous work receive visual input. We, and we know that from uh, larger flies, uh, blow flies. And I don't want to get hung up on, um, on the names of, of these muscles. I just want to group them into two major groups, uh, the basilars and the axillaries. And so, as I just said, uh, we know from some previous work that these muscles receive visual input. And so for a long time, there's been this idea that maybe when a fly is trying to, trying to actively maneuver, they could send um, signals to, the, to these muscles, which would control the, 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 the motion of the halt here and then because the halt here helps mediate uh, reflexes of the head and wings, you could get um, an active turn that basically takes advantage of the halt here's gyroscopic sensing capability. And so this is something that's known as the control loop hypothesis. And just to sort of restate that a little more formally, you can imagine a situation where the fly is flying, the, the wings and halt here's are, are beating um, and providing uh, rhythmic feedback to the wing steering muscles. As the fly gets visual input, that that visual input is that those commands are sent to uh, the halt here steering muscles, and then the halt here steering muscles are going to change the motion or the mechanics of of the halt here itself. Um, and then, because the halt here is a big mechanosensory organ, that's going to change the mechanosensory feedback it provides. And then the halt here has a direct connection to the uh, 
wing steering muscles, and uh, that's going to change the that could potentially change the uh, phase of activation or the um, or just activate uh, your phasic muscles, and that would change wing motion and aerodynamic forces and change the flight tra trajectory. So this hypothesis makes uh, three predictions. The first is that the haltier muscles should be under visual control, right? So we've seen that in blowfly. So what we what we'd expect is that in flight, <coughs> excuse me, um, that the haltier muscle should be actively controlled uh, while the animal's flying. So something I should also point out is that one one of the reasons I brought up blowflies is also that blowflies when they're walking around they beat their haltiers, but in the case of Drosophila. Um, and other, some other flies, they actually don't beat their haltiers while they're walking. Um, so it's important that the haltiers are, actu are actively being controlled while the animal's flying. Second is that uh, visual input should modulate the, the amount of mechanosensory feedback that the haltier provides, and that should be independent of physically rotating the animal, right? Because if, if the haltier is, is only a gyroscopic sensor, then the second uh, prediction should should fail. Right? And then finally, activating the haltier muscles should alter the activity of the wing steering muscles. Okay. So this is going to serve as a framework for um, a good portion of the talk. Um, so let's first look at if the haltier muscles are under visual control. So to do this, we can, again, take advantage of the genetic tools in Drosophila and label um, the haltier steering muscles um, and record their activity using uh, G-CAMP. So we can take advantage of the fact that when a motor neuron excites a muscle, you get a big release of calcium. And so you get these big calcium signals um, from, from muscles while an animal is, is moving. And so what, what we can do is just use um, that, those, that LED arena I showed you earlier, and we can um, also use the IR LED photo detector pair to control uh, a camera and just use standard epifluorescence microscopy to record um, haltier muscle activity. So this was done by my colleague Thad Lindsay really nicely in the case of the wing steering muscles. Um, and so you can see, you know, you can see in some cases this muscle is flashing. And so it's it's basically active, whereas this muscle, this is B1, it's it's sort of like a dial, it's, it's getting dimmer and brighter, and so that's indicative of, of it being tonic. But these muscles are, in comparison to the haltier muscles, are very, very big. You can do this with a 10x objective. In my case, I had to use a 50x objective, and we weren't sure if we could even see anything. All right, so what I want to show you is a movie um, of, of the left haltier muscles. So we've got the, the basilars and the axillaries here, and what we're going to do is um, play, uh, we're going to have the world appear to rotate to the fly's left. And so the fly has a tendency to, uh, doesn't like that the world is moving relative to it because this is playing an open loop. So it's going to try and turn with the stimulus. So it's left wing beat amplitude is going to decrease. And then we're going to see what happens with the, um, with the haltier muscles. And so this movie is going to play in, in real time. And so here's the stimulus in the middle. And so uh, the first thing I want to point out is that there's a baseline level of activity, particularly in the basilar muscles. But then as the stimulus comes on, as the fly begins to turn, you can see in both cases that, um, in both muscle groups, that the muscles um, light up, right? So, you know, the visual input is modeling the haltier muscle activity. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, I spent a fair bit of time explaining how the halt here acts as a gyroscopic sensor. And so one thing I was interested in was understanding um, how these, if, if the halt here steering muscles have any sensitivity to particular um, rotations around the animal. And so I, I, to test that, what I did was, um, so for example, I presented a stimulus where the world appeared to rotate um, sort of clockwise in front of the animal. So this arrow using the right-hand rule would be roll clockwise and looking at um, wing beat amplitude, so the behavior and um, muscle activity, and then shifting the center of rotation in 30 degree increments to look at um, you know, um, motion in the yaw direction all the way to 
roll counterclockwise and back again. And so what you can do is then look at how the behavior and also the fluorescence of the halter muscles um, changes. And then uh, just construct tuning curves by integrating the um, response during the stimulus epoch. And so what I want to show you is um, the tuning curves for wing motion, for the halter muscles, and then for comparison, um, a subset of some wing muscles. And so I'm going to show these as a polar plot. So if we take a, a um, <coughs> excuse me, sagittal section through the fly, and then our axes. So we've got roll right, yaw right, roll left, yaw left. And so if we do this experiment, we see that um, the the wing motion is tuned to, and this is again the the left wing. So um, the fly the the left wing responds most strongly to um, yaw to the right. So if the world's rotating this way, you get a big excursion of the wings. And if you look at the halter muscles, you see that they're also tuned, but in the opposite direction as wing motion, and then looking at one subset of wing muscles, but this is true across um, wing muscles, you also see that they're also tuned, just in a different way. So the halter muscles are tuned to visual rotation in some non-random way. and um, and if we go to our prediction, so the halter muscles are under visual control. And then what we'd expect is that um, that is either changing the motion of the halter in some way or changing its mechanics, like making the base stiffer. Um, and so ideally the next experiment would be that you just look at um, the motion of the halter while the fly is flying and you present different kinds of visual stimuli. But that is an exceeding, it is exceedingly difficult to, um, to, to measure any sort of discernible differences, partly because when a fly is tethered and you present visual stimuli, you also get abdominal ruttering. So any sort of change in halter motion is going to be obscured by these, these much larger changes in the motion of the abdomen. But because the halter is uh, a mechanosensory organ, we can use, uh, we can use um, changes in mechanosensory feedback as a proxy for changes in halter motion or mechanics. So that's what we're going to need to look at next. So um, in this case, what we've got here is um, a dissected uh, fly nervous system. So we've got the brain, the cervical connective, and the ventral nerve cord. And in this case, what we've got labeled here are um, the, the halter nerve and the halter tract. And so the halter is a big mechanosensory organ and it has these big projections or extensive projections I should say into the VNC and all the way up into this region of the brain called uh, the subesophageal zone and it has these big axon terminals and so what we can do is uh, take advantage of a technique that's been developed over the past what uh, 10 yeah about about 10 years where you can uh, tether a fly by the back of its head, dissect open the head capsule, and then um, use, again, use calcium imaging, in this case, using a two photon microscope um, while the animal's flying, and look at how, uh, in this case, how the halter axon terminals respond to different kinds of visual stimuli, right? So in this case, it's important to keep in mind that the fly is rigidly tethered by its head, um, so we're not going to rotate the animal in any way. We're just going to rotate the visual world. And then to track um, wing motion, in this case, we're going to use a camera and some machine vision software. Okay. So in this case, what I'm going to show you now is the right halter axon terminals. So that's outlined here in red. We've got the right wing bead amplitude and the halter um, terminal fluorescence. And so in this case, the world is going to rotate again to the fly's left. So now the right wing bead amplitude is going to increase. And again, the, the, um, the video is going to play in real time. All right. And I think that's everything I need to cover. All right. So let's go. And then, so th th again, here's our stimulus. And so there are a couple of things I want to point out. First is that before the stimulus comes on, there's a baseline level of activity, which is consistent with the idea that the halter is beating up and down, providing rhythmic feedback um, to the animal. And then what you see is that when the stimulus comes on, the, uh, the amount of halter feedback increases, right? So the halter is not merely a, 
a gyroscopic sensor. It's not just detecting body rotations. It's also able to report on um, what the, the visual world is, is doing. And, and, and so it's get, the animal's getting feedback, mechanosensory feedback on just visual input, okay? So that's, that's a really important point that the halt here is under active control. Now, is the halt here, is the halt here motion or the mechanics changing? That's the, that's the other thing that, that I was interested in looking at. So again, the halt here and the wing are serially homologous structures and, the, and both have companiform sensilla embedded within them. And we know from um, some previous work that if you say present different kinds of um, different kinds of periodic stimuli of different amplitudes, what you'll end up with is at the lowest amplitudes you'll get um, phase lock firing at a, of a, of a given companiform, um, and then as you increase the the amplitude of the stimulus, you'll you'll recruit additional companiforms. Um, and so the idea is that as the wing is is beating up and down, um, you have you have different companiforms with different preferred phases firing each wing stroke. And so if um, if the halt here motion is being controlled basically in the same way as the motion of the wings, what we'd expect is doing uh, that same calcium imaging experiment. We should see a similar kind of result where presenting a visual stimulus leads to uh, changes in um, the fluorescence of the, the wing axon terminals, okay? And so I, I did just that where I, um, so this is now a, a line that labels the wing, the wing nerve, or at least the, the wing nerve that is relevant for flight control. And um, again, they, they come in and actually split, the, this is something called the dorsal fork, but it, it also goes up through the cervical connective to have these large um, projections in the subesophageal zone. And when you record from these, um, doing the same experiment, what you see is that um, just as you expect, there's a baseline level of activity when the, before the stimulus comes on, which is consistent with the idea that the, the wing is beating, providing feedback. And then as the animal turns, you get an increase in um, fluorescence. So the idea um, that we have is that the halt here is being controlled basically the same wing, same way that the wing is being controlled, just by the halt here muscles controlling um, the motion of the structure, which controls the mechanosensory feedback it provides. Okay, and then lastly, in terms of testing this hypothesis, um, we should be able to activate the halt here muscles and see if that changes the activity of the wing steering muscles. And so we know from some previous work that if you say look at this one region at the base of the halt here and record from the B1 muscle, that um, if you stimulate the whole halt here, you'll get occasional um, EPSPs, uh, excitatory, excitatory postsynaptic potentials, and occasional um, firing, occasional spikes firing. And if you remove this this area completely and you stimulate the whole halt here, you'll still get these compound action potentials, but no EPSPs. And then if you do the converse, um, you, you recover these EPSP. So, um, we so we have some idea that the, the halt here is providing some information to um, some of the wing steering muscles, but it wasn't, it, it wasn't yet clear if that was only during body rotations or during, um, or just during flight more generally. So to do this, we could take advantage of um, some split GAL4 lines developed um, by Genelia Research Campus. So this is one line that labels the power muscle of the halt here and one of the axillary muscles. And um, what we're going to do is activate these motor neurons optogenetically and record from um, one tonically active muscle and one phasically active muscle, okay? So first looking at the tonic muscle, so what we'd expect is that if you activate this muscle, you should see um, either a phase delay or a phase advance in when this muscle fires. And so first, um, here are a bunch of overlaid um, muscle action potentials from the B1 muscle. And so when we, the wing B1 muscle, I should say. And so when we activate um, these, two, these two muscles, what we see is that 
we get a phase advance. This, this muscle starts firing earlier in the stroke cycle, right? And if we look across flies, if we look at the instantaneous phase, what we see is that there's a preferred phase, just what we expect. And then once you activate these muscles, you get a really significant advance and then a, a recovery, okay? And similarly, if we repeat this experiment, but record from the phasic muscles, so in this case, we should see basically silence and then recruitment. Um, we see just that, where when we activate these muscles, now you get a burst of um, a burst of activity from the B2 muscle. And if you look at, instead of instantaneous phase, you look at spike rate, you see that when you activate these muscles, you get firing and then a decay. And if we look at a different set of um, halt here muscles, so a different set of axillaries, and we record from um, the same tonically active muscle, what we see is we see a phase delay where now when you activate these muscles, the, the, the wing surrey muscle fires later in the stroke cycle. And if we, again, look across, if we look at instantaneous phase across flies, we see that it like slightly raises. So just by activating these four little, these four really tiny muscles, the scale bar is 25 microns, um, we can capit recapitulate all of the um, all the modes of control that flies have over over the wing steering system. So, um, what do we think is going on? So, the halt here is both a gyroscopic sensor and a sort of adjustable timing mechanism, where um, as the as the fly is flying, it's getting visual input, which is activating the halt here muscles, which changes the motion of the halt here. And as a result, changes the mechanical sensory feedback it provides. And then that, because of the halt here's direct connection to the wing steering muscles, that can change either the activation phase of tonically active muscles or recruit uh, physically active muscles, which will change wing motion and change the aerodynamic forces um, produced. And, um, and then the other thing is that, is that the sort of gyroscopic sensing capability of the halt here may just be an elaboration of this, this circuit. And the reason that, that I think that is that um, in a number of, in locusts and uh, hawk moths, we have evidence that the, the hind wing, so those, those two animals have four wings. And in, in both cases, the mechanical sensory feedback from the hind wing is really important for determining um, the ensuring proper motion and uh, the proper firing phase of the four wing uh, steering muscles. So it, it seems like this, this sort of control loop circuit is based on something that's evolutionarily conserved. Okay. So now with the time I've got left, what I want, what I want to do now is talk a little bit about what the lab um, has going on. And so the, the question that really animates me right now is, um, is, is that the halt here, if you take a look at the halt here, it's got all these different uh, companiforms and cell that are arranged in these really stereotyped and precise rows, or precise fields, I should say. Um, and we don't really have a clear sense of how those, how those anatomical arrangements map to different functions. Um, and so right now there are two major questions that my lab is looking at. So one is how is just generally how is halt here mechanical sensory feedback encoded? And then because the halt here is this, this big um, nerve, how how is that that spatial information preserved um, in the brain and in the in the um, the central nervous system more generally? All right, so let's just focus on this first question. So something so this this problem sort of relates to um, both my work as a postdoc and as a graduate student where I've been very concerned with um, how biomechanics and neuroscience intersect. And so going back to um, like the Barnell, the Barnell, the, the hearing system of Barnell is, doesn't just have this really precise neural circuit, but there's also, um, there's also some biomechanical uh, specializations that it has to detect timing differences. Uh, there's a number. There's a lot of work on the lateral line of a fish, and um, also the cricket circle system. So, all in all these cases, the sensor mechanics and where you place your sensors determines how a real 
a generic sensor um, can filter uh, environmental stimuli. Um, oh, and I'm missing a slide. That's no, that's it's okay. Um, so, so I, I'm trying to test this, or, or we're trying to test this in the case of the halt here. Um, and so, to do this, what we've got is um, a fly again tethered to a pin and um, using epifluorescent microscopy. But instead of looking at the halt here muscles, what we're doing is expressing uh, GCAMP in the halt here nerve itself and then imaging on the halt here. So imaging from the dendrites while the fly is flying. Um, so what I'm gonna do is show you a movie that I collected right before I actually started my, right before, like two days before I got to Chapel Hill. And so what we'll have here is the bulb of the halt here Here's the stalk, here's the base. And what I'm going to show you is the left minus right wing beat amplitude and the fluorescence of the stalk and base. And again, it's gonna play in real time. This is the right halt here. And in this case, the fly is just trying to track a stripe um, in front of it. And so um, hopefully one thing you can see is that the base has these rather large fluctuations. Um, and that was actually pretty surprising to me because the, the, the base of the halt here is thought to be the business end of, of the gyroscopic sensing capabilities. And the, the stalk, the idea is that as it's speeding up and down, um, uh, just during normal flight, that's helping provide rhythmic feedback um, to the animal. And so the, so the idea that you're seeing these large changes in um, the fluctuation, large changes in the, in the activity of the base is consistent with um, the idea that the base is, is providing feedback to the B1 muscle and, and is might be the business end of the control loop hypothesis, right? But you still see, I mean, and this is just done with a 10x objective. And right now we're we're going, we've got a lot of plans to do this with our um, with the 50x objectives that I used as a postdoc. So just looking at, at these data, if we just look at how the fluorescence changes as a function of the left and minus right wing beat amplitude, um, if we look first at the, the field on the stalk, um, what we see is that uh, you get this sort of U-shape pattern where for larger excursions of, of, the, of the wings, right, you, you get uh, bigger changes in uh, for fluorescence regardless of which direction, right? So if the animal's turning a lot to the left or to the right, you get these larger changes in the fluorescence of the stalk. Whereas if you look at the base, you get a little bit more of a linear correlation between um, as wing beat amplitude changes, so changes the uh, the fluorescence of the, whole, the campaniforms at the base. And so going back to the idea that the, the um, the wing steering muscles in the are recruited either linearly or non-linearly. Um, one something that occurred to me, something that, that we're that we're thinking about is well, is it possible that that sort of functional stratification of the wing steering muscles may have some basis in the in the haltier and the different fields of the haltier themselves? Could you have a field that's linearly linearly recruited and a field that's non-linearly recruited, but remember that the um, the an individual campaniform has a preferred um, firing phase and it only fires once per per uh, cycle. So if that's the case, if it, if it is indeed the case that the different campaniforms are recruited by different um, are recruited by either by different mechanisms, that should have some basis in the halt here muscles themselves. And so something that we've also been looking at is just looking at, so uh, there's a lot of work, so uh, Gabby Maiman's lab has been doing a lot of, has done a lot of work on these sort of spontaneous saccades that flies execute um, and using a lot of um, impressive uh, analytical techniques to sort of back out what the what the animal is, is doing and I'm like thinking about efference copy. And so we're just trying to use a similar, in some ways we're using a kind of similar approach where we're um, recording the activity of the uh, halt here muscles while the fly is flying and then looking for these, these 
um, spontaneous turns and and treating them at, because they are all or nothing events, treating them as sort of uh, behavioral spikes. And then um, what we can do is is sort them based on um, based on their magnitude. So you know, from the leftmost turns to the rightmost turns. So these are decile means. And then look at the fluorescence associated with each um, or the the fluorescence deciles for each of the different groups of muscles. So, so, so for example, so if we've got the left mass right wing beat amplitude here, and it's sorted into these different deciles, and we look at the um, the the mean in this gray box, which is the the sorting region um, for each, each decile, what we see is that you know you get a nice smooth change as you go from the leftmost to the rightmost turns, right? So flies have great control of their um, of their of their of their wings. And if we look at say the, the basilar muscles, what we see is um, again a sort of linear relationship. And if we look at the axillaries, a different muscle group, what we see is a nonlinear relationship, right? Where what we see is that for the leftmost and the rightmost turns you you get recruitment, but then there's a sort of basin of activity. And so looking at, at this, I was pretty surprised to, to find this. Um, I would label the basilar muscles as being uh, tonically active, right? Because they're linearly recruited and the axillary muscles as being uh, phasic because they're non-linear recruited. And if we, again, go back to our different um, regions of the halt here, if we look at the base, it's sort of linearly recruited and then the stalk is non-linearly recruited. So there's potential that this, um, that these different recruiting recruitment mechanisms of halter feedback have their basis in how the halter muscles are recruited. And so the other plan um, is also to look at how how this sort of strategy relates to um, the wing steering muscles themselves and, and relate the different recruitment strategies of the base or the stock on the halter to different um, phasic and tonic wing steering muscles. So that's one thing. And then um, the, the other thing is that, again, all this information on the halt here is highly spatially organized at the periphery, but how, but the one question, one major question is, is that information, um, is that spatial organization preserved as, as the halt here nerve enters the central nervous system and what are the principles behind that? Um, so this is something that gets, again, back to, again, thinking about these sort of biomechanically specialized um, timing circuits like in the case of crickets or the, the fly antenna or um, hearing in bush crickets so you have these these really tightly arranged maps of mechanosensory feedback and so that's sort of the the inspiration for for this kind of problem um, for us and so similarly the the if we look at the halt here um, and you look at the different regions of the halt here, the, the, the axonal projections are, are, highly, uh, are highly position specific, both um, when it comes to an individual field and then like looking at individual rows, both you know, uh, going medial to, medial to lateral or anterior to posterior. And um, I should also say that, uh, what am I trying to say with that? Just that the, the, we're also thinking similarly about um, how wing information is, is organized. So this is a collaboration that we're, we're starting with um, uh, Wei Chung Lee at Harvard and John Tuttle's lab at University of Washington. And uh, I've, so an undergrad who works in my lab, Fiona, and uh, my lab manager, Lily Price, are we're working with with those two groups to um, to work on this project, where we're going to prepare um, prepare flies for uh, in principle for EM imaging, but then you take advantage of the um, the X ray synchrotron at Grenoble and use this method called X ray nano holotomography to do these really high resolution reconstructions of um, in this case the example I'm showing you is is the leg, but you can but the idea is for us is to look at how the the wing and halter companiform fields 
are organized from from the periphery all the way to um, all the way through the, the central nervous system because with this method you can um, place a specimen in the x-ray synchrotron and then get basically a full reconstruction where you can look at you know motor neurons muscle and exoskeleton um, with and it's a method that would take to do this by em would take a very 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 long time and so we have so we're, we're really excited about this we're, hopefully we'll be able to tell you more about that in the in the near future and in addition the other thing is is looking at is going back to the functional imaging of the axon terminals um, during flight and doing some different kinds of image processing so for example if you look at um, so this is a different um, different right halt here axon terminal um, and if we do, um, if we record the the wing motion while we're recording the um, the fluorescence from the from the fly, if we do a cor pixel by pixel correlation with the uh, behavior, what we see is that um, so these bright regions are indicative of high correlations. Dark regions are indicative of lo of lower correlations. We see this sort of this bright region here that's correlated with the ipsilateral wing stroke motion, and correspondingly you have a region that is correlated with contralateral wing stroke. Um, so you can imagine that if if we're thinking about, if this is my ipsilateral wing and its wing beat amplitude increases, and that leads to um, some region of haltier firing, and then you know because the haltier helps control the neck, you would get the neck turning like this. So you can imagine that's sort of a stabilization reflex. Whereas if the contralateral wing increases and now the head turns like this, that's more of an active maneuver. So again, we're seeing we've, we're starting to get some evidence of um, the sort of separation between the between the different regions of the halt here that are related to the the sort of dynamic range and different kinds of things that the the fly has to do in terms of stabilizing and actively maneuvering. So the hope is that you know in a few years I can tell you a bit more about how the haltier fields are functionally organized, um, and maybe that's related to their locations on the on the base and stalk. Um, so with that, I want to thank the folks in my lab, some of our collaborators, and funding sources past and present, and take any questions that you've got. So thanks very much. That was a fantastic talk. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, we have a few questions. I can uh, I can maybe read them out and then uh, you can add any comments you'd like to. So um, Swarta says, uh, nice talk. The whole tier and wings are also mechanically coupled by the cuticle of the thorax. So how does this mechanical coupling interact with the neuron coupling that you described? Yeah, that's a really that's a really good question because um, so um, Tom V. Diora did some really nice work where she looked at if you just do these really these really subtle cuts in um, this region of the thorax, you can disrupt the mechanical coupling of the wing and halt here. So you could imagine that disrupting that mechanical coupling would change um, would change the 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 relation the phase relationship between haltier feedback and wing feedback and no one's really looked at so I, I know people have looked at how that changes the the wing motion and wing beat frequency but I, I don't know if anyone's looked at how that change how that might change um, the the firing phase or the recruitment of the different wing steering muscles because you because I mean, my, I would imagine that that would have a large impact on, say, like just for example, when this B1 muscle fires, right? Where now if the wing and halt here are, are sort of cattywampus, now you can imagine a situation where B1 just sort of fires, not so much randomly, but at a very different phase than it would normally, or, or just does something that you might not even predict from, um, from what, from what we know of the physiology. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
That's a great question. Um, then uh, Anna Hobbits asks, uh, does it, whether each alt, alt here gets input from both eyes or whether the input is lateralized? Because presumably to make the correct turn, distinguishing between signals from one or the other eye. Yeah, so um, my recollection is that, um, so the the tuning of the halt here muscles that, that we saw seem to be consistent with one with us with a, a type of descending inner neuron that just goes to one side so my suspicion is that um that each halt here is getting input from a, a single eye now it's also possible that they're that they're getting input from the contralateral eye through some other means um but that hasn't been identified yet mm -hmm. Yeah, and then um, last question from uh, Karina, who asks, uh, so campaniform sensor on the legs are directionally sensitive due to their morphology. Does this also apply for wing campaniform sensor? And if so, will changing the angle of the whole tier during the steering movements alter the forces and change the phase at which uh, a sensor right. fires that, during the That is a cycle? really great question. and. I found the slides that I was looking for, so let me share my screen again. All right. So, um, so going back to this image, if we look at the stalk, this is and this is um, from a bunch of different flies. Um, you see that the the campaniforms on the stalk have this sort of a, the body of an accordion kind of structure where they're they're sort of fused. Um, this is this is anterior to posterior, um, and then they're again in these rows. Whereas at the base, you have a more typical shape of the dome, and but they're still in these really really tight rows. And so, if you look at um, if you or another way to say that is you can label the mechan transduction channels of the neurons underneath, and when you do that, what you see is that the um, campaniforms along the stalk are arranged sort of along the long axis of the halt here. So that, again, gets back to the, the hypothesis I mentioned about um, as the halt here is beating up and down, these may detect that sort of in-plane bending. And then the ones at, at the base are, are oriented off axis. And so the idea for a long time has been that that, is, that may enable flies to detect um, the changes in the tip trajectory due to the Coriolis force, and in addition, may also be how the base is transducing information um, just during, you know, in what I showed you, at least preliminarily, preliminarily during tethered flight, where you get these fluctuations um, in in the uh, amount of feedback that it's providing. So, um, yeah, I would say that that um, the directional sensitivity definitely plays a role. And also because um, campaniform sensilla, from what how we understand it, um, a campaniform is a campaniform is a campaniform. So what really matters is, is not so much that you have any sort of neural specialization for, your, for these campaniforms. What you have instead is, um, basically mechanical specialization where where you place your sensor and how many of them you have is really determining the kind of information that you can get. Um. Great, yeah, thank you. Um, okay, so I'd like to once more thank, uh, thank Brad for joining us today. Uh, it was a really fantastic talk. Um, and for those of you who are who are joining the extended Q and A afterwards, um, I I've sent you the Zoom link. We'll be there in, in a few minutes. Um, and I'd also like to plug that next week we'll we'll have another talk. Um, this time we'll be joined joined by Daniel Musida from Rockefeller University. Um, so we'll be going back to the gut and how the um, 
immune system in the gut mucosa is regulated by uh, neural input. So um, I hope to see many of you back next week. And yeah, uh, thank you for having me. Friend.